Welcome everyone to this Rush Measurement Training Seminar on the subject of the Big Steps Computer Program. Welcome here to Chicago. I hope you've all received a copy of the, the handout, which basically contains an annotated run of the program and a copy of the Big Steps Manual so you can follow what we're doing. For all, when in doubt, read the manual. And for those who talk computers, a copy of the computer program, Big Steps which is that remarkably simple to run as a program. And the difficulty is all in setting things up and understanding what the output is. Setting things up is basically a mechanical operation. Once you've done it once or twice for your own data, it's usually routine after that. So most of our time will be devoted to interpreting the output. I'd like to point out a couple of books to help us on our way here. So, for those of you not familiar with these texts, you'll find them very useful. Best Test Design by the uh, then writer Mark Stone, written in 1978, which outlines basic dichotomous data, like ROM data, and grading scale analysis by then writer Jeff Masters, put together in 1982. Uh, these books will be available in a break. We have a break about uh, every hour or so. I find that. 45, 50 minutes is about as long as we can gather, and we take about 10 minutes and proceed on. So there's this book, Rating Scale Analysis, written about 1982, which discusses rating scale data and also goes into more detail into the estimation and fit statistics and things like that for those who really want to get involved in the math. We won't be doing much math over the next couple of days. Uh, as uh, algebra, but we'll be doing quite a lot conceptually. Here is a mathematical book. This is George Rush's uh, original 1960 text, made up from his lecture notes by some of his and students and then edited by him, which outlines his original theory. And uh, for those who want to know something of the history and how Rush came up with the idea, again, he was a mathematician, so it is very mathematical. So there's that text, there's that book available. And then for those who want to be up on the latest Rush gossip, now, of the latest ideas, there are the Rush measurement transactions. This is the assembled back issues of it, going back to uh, 1987 when Richard Smith and Ben Wright started. Richard Smith was the first editor. And in the combined at back issues, they now go up to page 386. The last issue is just out, and this also has an index, obviously, like that. So quite a number of uh, the ideas and questions that have come up over the years have been answered in the back issues in one way or another. So this is a handy reference for it. Also, just interesting to look at, at least for me. Of course, I'm biased because I'm the editor. <laughs> right. So let's talk a little bit now about measurement to start with. Do stop and ask me if you get some questions. So here, here, are, some, here are some things that tend to get measured. These are rocks or stones, whatever you have to call them. And uh, we see that there are several different ones here, different sizes. And uh, before we can even start measuring these things, we've obviously got to have some theory about how we're going to measure them. I'm just looking physically now. Just if we get a hold of a ruler and decide that we're going to measure these stones, We've got to have some theory about how we're going to measure them, what, what it is important to us to measure, uh, how we're going to measure them so we can compare one with the other. So I'm just going to put up a little acronym here. That Ben Wright is very keen on acronyms, but I, I like on my own. I differentiate myself from him, so I just not sort of a, a long distance appendage of him. So basically one has to one has to start off with a theory. Then there is the a current. How many hours in a current? Two hours. Okay. This is right. Sure, correct. I would guess so. Yeah. I had a feeling. A current is it. Oh, you see what a sad state English education has fallen into. <laughs> Now that looks even worse. <laughs> All right, then there is the uh, observation. 
Let's just think about this for a second. Because uh, say that say this room started shaking, something we don't want to do. But there, there are two reactions we could have. One is, oh, the building is shaking. The other is, or one of the others is, it's an earthquake. All right? Now, in order to know that it was an earthquake that we're going through, we'd have had to have a theory about earthquakes before the thing actually occurred. That's the only way we know when the building starts shaking there's an earthquake, because we already had a theory about what happens in earthquakes. So when the building starts shaking, we say, oh, it's an earthquake, not, not a big truck came by outside, or something like that. And often, even if the occurrence actually happened first, in some sense, it hasn't occurred to us mentally until we do have a theory problem. So uh, if a few years ago we experienced a building shaking, we might suddenly say, now, oh, that must have been an earthquake. So then we, could, we reinterpret this event that occurred before now as, an, as related to our theory. So the fact that something may have occurred years ago doesn't mean that it's a sort of for our reality it doesn't occur later. So for instance, we can get the data set from several centuries ago. For instance, one data set I've used is that of an art critic of the 1700s who evaluated the painting styles of various people. Even though that data was collected long ago, we can apply new theories to it, and then it becomes, that data set becomes a cut, so it has, takes on a different meaning to what it originally had. It becomes uh, something different. So it now, it now becomes a, an occurrence of something that we're interested in that relates to our theory. And then, of course, uh, what happened, like an earthquake, it's, it's interesting to say, oh, the building is shaking, it's an earthquake. But then we probably want to turn that into some sort of observation if we were seismologists, we want to say, well, certain things happen during, during earthquakes, we want to observe them, or we want to take particular note of certain things. For instance, on the stone here, we might be interested in observing its longest dimension, whatever it was. For that, this one, it seems reasonably clear. For this one, it seems less clear. And for this one, we, we might even have an argument over which was its longest dimension. I think they're sort of, they're sort of square, I'm not really sure. So anyway, once we've got these observations, and this is this part of the thing, we, we tend to feel that we know what we're doing, but as it turns out, a lot of our work involves, uh, do we really know what we're doing? For instance, when we give someone a math test, we tend to assume we know what math is, and we know what a math item is, so we're right down here immediately at, did the child get it right or wrong? The observation. But then as time goes by, what tends to happen, and I'll outline this, is that we, we're challenged. Was this really a math item? Do we really understand what math is? Well, maybe not the math, by this time we understand what math is. But if this uh, attitude surveys or psychological surveys, uh, psychological assessment, we may not at all know what it is that we're really looking at and talking about when we're talking about, say, depression. Depression may be just such a very general term that um, it's different for different, uh, for different people, or the raw shark blood test, the same sort of thing. It's, it's virtually different for, for every person who administers it. <laughs> if they have, each person has their own idea about how it's supposed to work. So we go from observation, which is usually, in the right long case, is this what we're looking for or not, to scoring. So I'm not using the word observation model here and scoring model. Observation model would be, did we, did we see this person get this right or wrong? Scoring model would be, how are we now going to score this right and wrong? It's probably the traditional thing is to say, well, right equals one, and wrong equals zero. This has the, the nice feature that when we add up all, this, all these, we get a total raw score, which is neatly ordered with how we usually perceive people's uh, ability. Or the greater the ability in man, the more right answers they're going to get, so when we add up all these ones, the bigger the raw score. But we've already discovered here that this is, this is really a rank order type of operation. So, we, so we'll look a bit more closely at how this rank ordering ordering nature of this works, but we'll just continue on down this line here. Then we get what we're concerned about, which is 
to take measurement, which is converting these ordinal information into linear or interval scale. We follow S.S. Stevens interval scale information. And this is a lot of what we'll be involved about, involved in. But we could say that following on from this measurement procedure, there's various analysis we do. Some of it's done for us by big steps, and we have to interpret it. Some of it we might do externally. And then that leads us back to maybe revise our theory. In fact, it's, it's quite likely that we will. We might decide, for instance, after having looked at it, we have a theory that this is a, this is a math test that we've given. We uh, get some kids to take the test. We observe their responses. We count up the right ones. We construct a measurement system from it. We examine the results of that measurement operation. And then we discover that we have to amend our theory that this was a math test to start with. Because we discovered that right in the middle, there's a, there's a bank of uh, language items that sort of wandered in. Someone thought they were math items, but it turns out that in fact that the, say, the reading difficulty of these items is way more than the arithmetic difficulty of them. So in fact, they're not really math items at all. They're really some sort of literacy items, and they've just got included in the test because on the original theory they were math items, but after having gone through this, we realized, well, even though literacy and math are highly correlated, this, these particular items really aren't part of our theory of math. They're really part of the theory of literacy, which has a little bit of a, a quantitative component. So in the course of a big steps analysis, we quite frequently, in fact, generally, have to go back and revise our ideas that these, these particular items are all the sorts of items that we want, and also that the people, the occurrences, are actually occurrences relative to our theory. As for instance, say someone's taking a math test and all they're doing is guessing their way through it. Are they really occurrences related to our theory? In other words, we're, we're interested in earthquakes, and every so often it is a big truck going by that's shaking the building. Well, obviously that big truck shaking the building is not really helping us understand the uh, structure of the Earth's core, or whatever it is you're interested in, plate tectonics or something, so that we have to drop out the truck shaking observations, just like if we're trying to understand the nature of math and kids' math ability, we really want to drop out their guessing. Now, it may be that we've got to report on every shaking of the building, or everybody that took the test, whatever the reason. Well, that's fine. We, we can do that at the end, but we don't want to confuse ourselves and our ideas of the Earth's structure by including the trucks in while we're building up a seismological theory, just like as we're trying to establish the idea of a math construct, we don't want to include the people that are guessing, even though at the end, when it comes down to the final report, we may have to uh, somehow construct a math measure, even for the people that are just guessing their way through the test. So this is uh, Tooms Mat. Here's the acronym of the day. <laughs> no doubt to change tomorrow. <laughs> Someone's going to come up with the word here. This is going to absolutely astound everyone. So this is a quick overview of the, the conceptual way that we proceed. Let's, let's take just think for a moment about this step from scoring to measurement and a scoring measurement analysis. Because there are basically three things that we, we do when we're looking in this area. And all you have to do, Mark, is you have to add Rosh after analysis and you've got to keep smart. Okay. Maybe in here, something like realization or something. <laughs> I'd like the whole thing to split right. <laughs> I don't have to think of words. All right, there's a challenge in this couple of days. Because in the course of establishing a measurement system, or we could say uh, linearity, we also expect to establish two other things in our data, many other things too, but two important things here. One, we could say, is a construct. 
I was not only going to, to measure the people, and I must put them all in some order of ability. The order having more than just a rank ordering, which is what Ross called was giving us, but also a placement, position, location, uh, meaning. But we're also going to do the same thing for the items. And once we put the items in an order of difficulty, spaced according to their difficulty, we, are, we should have developed a construct, a map. For instance, uh, in a map test, we should expect to see the easy items at one end and the difficult items at the other. As you see it from the handout, we have uh, include this key map handout. I do. Uh, round about page 27 of the handout, in the reduced form here, is a copy of the key map diagnostic profile which was put together by Richard Woodcock in the late 1970s, I think now. Uh, this, is, this is somewhat reduced, but you probably can see that across the 13 lines here, there are map items, and uh, this is part of a test, I think published by American Government Service, if I remember rightly. And the items are listed, uh, position left to right according to their difficulty. And as you look across a line, for instance, if you look across the line, line E, subtraction, you can probably see that it goes from the left, the first item on the left is 1 minus 1 buttons. In other words, it's some sort of subtraction operation actually using buttons, solid objects. Then when you get to the middle of the line, it's got things like 76 minus 12, two digit subtraction, now an abstract subtraction. And by the time you get to the right side of the line, you're doing things like, uh, what's that, like six and a quarter minus two and something, two and some other fraction. So that's getting quite complicated subtraction. So these items are put across the line, but they've been positioned actually according to their difficulty. So not only does their order, but their location indicates their difficulty. And this is built up from the empirical data, from going out and testing thousands of children. These items have been in position according to their difficulty. And we would expect to see that this ordering and location has a meaning, or has a construct to it, construct to So if in the course of doing our analysis, we suddenly discover that the bottom button items which are the, the far right, that was turning out to be very difficult, apparently more difficult, than these uh, abstract fraction, we would think something has gone wrong because this, this contradicts our whole theories about subtraction and about the hierarchy of order. Now, it may cause us to revise our theory, but it may also cause us to revise the way that we perceive observations or our scoring model. For instance, a, a, problem, a, a frequent problem with the scoring model is on a multiple choice test if you're using a key you've got the wrong distractor keyed as the correct answer. That will obviously make that item have entirely the wrong difficulty and will fit it the wrong place into your construct theory. So if you discover an item that is conceptually easy, very hard, or vice versa, you may well find out that the problem is just that you have misidentified what is a right answer, what it is that you're looking for. You're not usually looking for ignorance, you're usually looking for knowledge. Of course, if this were a depression scale, you're probably looking for depression, not for happiness. So which way is up, you have to decide. Now, what, what we count as right. Is right an indication of health or an indication of sickness? Well, whatever it is, you've got to be consistent. <laughs> All right. So there's linearity, there's construct, and then there's coherence, which is, basically speaking, did the people succeed on, did, did any individual person basically succeed on easy items and fail on the hard items? Or did any, was any item succeeded on by the able people and failed on by the less competent people? That's the, uh, that has a lot to do with this analysis phase, which is sort of when we combine the information phase in the big set program. We spend a lot of time checking on the coherence. Because if the data is incoherent, in other words, if, it's, if we can't make sense of it, then we don't know what the whole analysis meant at all. So until we've got a reasonably clear pattern of what happened in the data, uh, we don't really know what to make of the measures that we produced. Now, years ago, Gutman's idea of coherence 
was that you, you get everything easy right and everything hard wrong, and that's the behavioral pattern. That was uh, Lewis Gutman. But uh, our idea of coherence, Rashi's proposal, which was, I could say, his advance on Gutman, but he didn't know Gutman's work at the time, uh, was that you don't have to get everything easy right, just most easy things right. And you don't have to get every hard thing wrong, just most hard things wrong. And that's a coherent pattern. And we use various statistical techniques called fit statistics to see how coherent or incoherent we are, how much we have succeeded or failed. And when we have, if we can achieve a, a pattern that is coherent enough, which we usually can if we have any sort of reasonable theory about what we're doing to start with, because most people have a good idea what they're doing before they begin, then if that idea is going to hold together at all, then we should be able to achieve uh, the, a construct which makes sense and come up with measurements from which we can infer the future. And this is really what we're doing here. This is a big difference between rush measurements and, say, uh, traditional raw score theory or uh, item response theory in general, is that those other methods are concerned about accurate descriptions of the past. They say, right, here was a set of data, let's parameterize it, let's characterize it in various different ways, and uh, try to describe the past as accurately as possible. We're not concerned with that, we're concerned with the future. We're trying to say, let's set up a system which is going to predict the future as well as possible. In other words, we don't want to parameterize all the little glitches and things that inevitably occurred in the past. You know, the fact that this person sort of had a little trouble with item four is maybe an interesting detail of the past and maybe has got some uh, diagnostic value. We might want to go back and say, now why did you have this problem with this particular item? It seems a little peculiar to us. What happened? Oh, well, it was at that moment that the fire bell went off. Oh, okay. All right, now that's an interesting detail of the past, but it's not really going to help us understand the future very well because we're not expecting fire bells to go off very regularly. Hopefully not at all. They just put a new fire, fire bell system in this building. I've yet to hear it operate, which is good. Uh, right, so we're, we're concerned with inference and with the future, not with precise description of the past. So we take a test not as being the definitive test, this is the math test. We take the items on the test as being representative of the sort of math items that we're interested in the person responding to in the future. So we're not so much interested in the person's response to item four now. Our, our question is, will the person in general in the future succeed on items like item four, of which item four is supposed to be a representative? Well, hopefully on the test, Item 5 is also a representative of those same sort of items. And so is item 6. So if the person succeeds on 5 and 6 but not on 4, we would say, well, in general, a person can answer items like item 4. just so happened that this particular item 4 they couldn't do. And uh, there may be particular reasons for that or not, we can discover. But, uh, so we're not interested in introducing uh, more and more parameters, for instance, like guessing parameters and discrimination parameters and things like that, because those tend to be particular to particular items. We want to be able to say, the next item that we invent, will the person be able to do that? If according to our construct theory, we should, if I make up another subtraction item, for instance, I should be able to position it along the subtraction line fairly well, just if I make one up out of my head. Because I can see what items are here. So if I make one up like um, uh, 22 minus 15, I'm pretty sure it's going to be close to 29 minus 16. Somewhere around there. Maybe a little harder because it may involve uh, borrowing or whatever method is called, cool, or uh, subtraction. But I know it's going to be about there. So that's, so, and if I have from the test my basic idea of what the person's ability is, I should be able to predict how likely it is that the person can succeed without knowing anything about uh, the guessability or the discrimination, etc. of that item, which uh, those t things tend to depend on the way that the item is written, and I want to get away as far as possible from the particular details of the items. Though, of course, we have to know them, 
in order to be able to set up the observation and score it. Uh, let, me, let me just talk. Any, any questions? Any thoughts? We'll, we'll just talk for a moment about the, uh, the relationship between the raw scores and measures. I'm going to raise myself now. Right, for, that, for those of you who haven't drawn this picture before, you see the picture in a moment. I'd like you to answer, and those who've seen it before, not to answer, at least initially. All right, so we have, we have somebody take two tests. Or we could think about somebody being rated by two judges. We could have somebody take the easy test, and somebody take the hard test. Or it could be some people with the lenient judge and the severe judge, or the uh, easy task and the difficult task, whatever it is. We can, this is not uh, restricted to education. I don't know talking about education, but there's, there's no reason why it shouldn't apply to uh, medical like therapy. Here's, the, here's, here's climbing stairs, here's feeding yourself. There's a, a, opposite ends of uh, one of the uh, rehabilitation scales. So, what score do we expect someone to get? This is we're talking now in terms of raw scores, just the typical count of raw score. You can think of this as being a hundred item test, and this is a hundred item test. What score do we expect someone to make on the hard test who makes zero on the easy test? Zero. Okay, that seems fairly clear. If you, if, if you can't get if you can only get the zero on the easy test, the hard test is way beyond it. That's the idea. Alright. So we'll just go. All right, for someone who makes 100 on the hard test, what do we expect that person to make on the easy test? Assuming it also on the easy test. 100, yeah. Obviously, I mean, if the person's so confident to make 100 on the hard test, easy test just a breeze. All right, so. All right, let's see. What about somebody who makes... 50 on the easy test. What, what do we expect them to make on the you know, hard test? Below 50. How many? Below 50. Below 50. Well, yeah, yeah, it must be below 50, otherwise it wouldn't be a hard test. Yeah. Because, you know, the way we know it's a hard test is people don't do as well as on the easy test. Uh, any, anybody make a guess? You've got a favorite number? 30. 30. Well, let, let's call it 25. Let's make it easy. 25. Okay. Okay, now what about um, 50 on the hard test? 75. Yeah, obviously you're going to get more on the easy test, otherwise it wouldn't be easy. And you know, we, we really don't think the person's so confident they're going to go 100, unless it's a really, really easy test. Obviously we don't know precisely. Now we could keep going at all the other scores, but the, the result's always the same. We end up with a curved relationship between what happens on the hard test and what happens on the easy test. It's inevitable. This, we haven't talked about any particular method of scoring. Or, you know, I've not said this is according to such and such a person's theory or anything like that. It, it's just, it's the inevitable relationship between raw scores on two tests, the hard test and the easy test, always ends up with this curvy linear, linear relationship. Now, for many purposes, as long as everybody is round about the center of the test and the tests aren't too peculiar, then we do have an area here where things are reasonably straight. Okay, so for so this is why raw scores have worked so well over the you know, couple of centuries now that they've been used uh, statistically. They have worked pretty well because over the central part of this area, things are reasonably straight. Now, there's there not other peculiar things going on when anybody takes a test. That uh, there's always a bit of uncertainty about what's going on. So this this straight line fits most sets of data pretty well. Most sets. 
The problems obviously start to happen when people are at the top and people are at the bottom. That's where we start to run into trouble, because clearly, up here, the slope of a line up here, or the slope of a line down there, is different. So there's a different relationship between a hard and an easy test at the top and the bottom than there is in the middle. So once we start <coughs> trying to equate the test, I was saying, well, if someone gets such and such on an easy test, how much we going to get on a hard test? While we're in the middle here, we can say, oh, it's just a matter of just adding a few. Just sort of slide this one over a bit, so we know they're going to get a bit more on the easy than on the hard. But the relationship, obviously, at the top and the bottom is different. Now, one of the, uh, for me, one of the most dramatic instances where I encountered this in practice was when I started working with the physical therapists. And they had noticed, they had noticed distinctly that if they drew the axis of time, which time in therapy is essentially an indicator of how much therapy. You do an hour a day. You go into the rehabilitation institute after your uh, car crash, you've had your surgery, and now they're trying to get you sort of back functioning again, and they're giving you all sorts of therapy, and usually a certain amount of day or a certain number of weeks, depending on what the particular regimen is that you're on. And they had got a raw score scale that went from something like 17 to 93. That's approximately 90. You get the idea of the sort of thing they were working on. And what they had noticed was, this is in raw scores here, what they had noticed with was the way that therapy seemed to work across time. That uh, they were always getting this curve of progress. That uh, it seemed that the beginning amount of therapy down here, when they began therapy, didn't seem to do much good according to the raw scores they were getting off the observation instruments they were doing. If you want to see something about what the observation instruments look like, it's actually up on page, part of it at least, is on page 29 in a, in a revised form. It's called the, uh, the FIM, the Functional Independence Measure. And uh, what we have here on page 29 is uh, Five of the items. Now this is this is the revised version of the instrument. Was, this was this was an instrument that's been turned into a measurement instrument, the key film. But what it had on the original item uh, test was uh, around about 19 items or so, approximately uh, uh, 18 items, I think. 18 items, each item on a scale from one to seven. And so somebody coming in who was totally incompetent with the rated ones, in fact that would get them a score of 18, and somebody who was very competent would get a score of 7. So 7 times 18, someone can do that. Huh? 126. 126, so the score must have come up to 6. <laughs> All right, we're already revising. But what they discovered was that when people came in, they were getting ones and twos, and it seemed for quite a long time they were down the bottom. Anyway. Then, there would be this dramatic improvement, and then, therapy just didn't seem to do any good anymore. So, uh, they came to the conclusion, and of course the, this therapy is very expensive, they came to the conclusion that, uh, though obviously you have to give therapy to people down here, you can't leave people unable to function, you can stop giving therapy to people who seem to be nearly well because this therapy is just as expensive as the rest of the therapy, because therapy is basically in therapy's time, which is the most expensive part about it, and facilities, the rooms and things like that. So uh, what you want to do is you want somewhere they calculated around here, there was some sort of break-even point, and you stop the therapy. Well, the problem was that what, in fact, they had observed wasn't the effectiveness of the therapy stopping. What they had observed was, in fact, the way that raw scores relate to any infinitely long measure. Let me erase this picture here. Because the relationship between raw scores and, or we could say, raw score or a probability, or a frequency, any of these things, are always on a boundary.
rounded interval, a limited range. But what we're interested in measuring, ability or something like that, has always got a conceptually infinite range. For instance, for our patients, we, we look at a fairly normal group of people here, but we know there are people of greater athletic ability than we are, and the whole idea of the Olympic Games is to try to find somebody of even greater athletic ability than anybody so far. So this is a potentially infinite range. Meanwhile, down the other range, it doesn't matter how incompetent somebody is, we could always imagine somebody less competent. And in fact, uh, one of the areas of development at the moment in medicine is of coma scales. Even after you're unconscious, you can have various levels of unconsciousness. And uh, if the, when the doctors are trying to deal with people who are in comas, obviously their intention is to get that person into a life of life of coma and ultimately back to consciousness. So uh, there's people now working on rating scales of degree of unconsciousness and of course, there's all sorts of levels of unconsciousness. There's any depth of unconsciousness they could conceive at even greater depth. So this, this horizontal is always infinite. And, but the vertical, which is what we observe, is always finite. So, well, 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 it's practically it's finite. And particularly when we think of it in terms of raw score and fixed test or probability of something occurring or counts of it occurring in a certain length of time, and something like that. So what happens? For somebody who is completely incompetent, minus infinity, they would score down here at zero. For somebody who has got a fantastic capability, whatever it is, math ability, running ability, they would be scoring at the top here. And somewhere in the middle, there is the uh, target zone, 50% success, the middle of the range, the person for whom this particular test instrument is uh, bracketing, whatever phrase you have to use. And we always end up, when we plot a fixed range against an infinite range, with the idea that an increase along the infinite range implies an increase along the fixed range, as it were, and vice versa. So we end up here with this monotonic uh, increasing relationship and this produces what's known as an OJOP. Any, any architects in here would object to the use of the OJOP for this shape, but it's, it's got historical reasons why it's called an OJOP. Architects would call it an OG. But the basic idea is that it's We've got a long range down here, infinite range where there's almost nothing happening, and an infinite range at the top where there's almost nothing happening. And it's just in the middle, around right about the target area, where we see the change, which is obvious. And if we give the if we take the uh, fourth grade arithmetic test, the early grade is all going to be down here. We hope the high school are all up here, and it's only going to we're going to see a difference across the test for the people around right about the fourth grade. And of course, when the, the rehabilitation people didn't realize that, in fact, this was the relationship they were doing with, dealing with, so they thought that at this point, therapy had stopped. When, in fact, what had happened was, at this point, they had topped out on their instruments. That was what, what had happened. So when we, in fact, converted, we applied this relationship to this plot which they had discovered, we discovered that, in fact, what was happening with therapy across time didn't look like that at all. It looked like that. That, in fact, therapy was working at the bottom, and it was working at the top. And this was, in fact, very reassuring to the therapist, because the, the therapists actually doing the therapy had known it was working. They could say, yes, the patient is doing better today than yesterday. We can see it. But it just so happened that the the way they were collecting the data, couldn't see it. So the uh, administrators and the insurance companies and things couldn't see that the patients were getting better from the numbers, though the therapists could see it from the patients. And once we had straightened out this curve for them, based on the case records of uh, something like 20 or 30,000 patients, uh, we were able to show them that in fact therapy didn't stop there, it kept working, 
And the therapy, in fact, had been working from the moment the patient had arrived, way back then on there. So this, this illustrates one area where this uh, lack of linearity, which seems somewhat of uh, an academic uh, point, this curve, this, this shape of the curve here, seems an academic point. But in fact, can have very practical implications if you're the one that's in going through a therapy. What was happening was they were sending people home, like for instance, they would be sending people home in wheelchairs or needing a certain amount of assistance, when in fact that was unnecessary. They kept going to therapy a little longer, they could have sent the person out walking, not needing any assistance at all when they got home, which is obviously better for the individual and in fact better for society as a whole. It lessens the overall cost of society with the investment of this uh, extra amount of therapy here. Right, let's, uh, let's take a break.